Hello and welcome to the Screen Composer Studio, a podcast about the musical storytellers behind some of your favorite films, shows, video games, and more. I'm your host, Adrian Ellis. Judith Gruber Stitzer is wonderfully articulate about how music affects moving images and narrative, and yet her approach is often very intuitive. She started her journey in New York and Jersey, learning harmonies by ear from her brother's doo-wop group before moving to Montreal to work with poet singer Marie Savard and the band Wonder Brass. She eventually became one of the National Film Board of Canada's most prolific composers, scoring Oscar-nominated films such as Animal Behavior, Wildlife, and When the Day Breaks, which also won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, among many others. Judith is quick to point out that she does more than animation, and indeed her resume boasts many live-action projects, including two films by the legendary Robert Altman. We discuss her work with that iconic director, as well as her perspective on working both as a composer and a sound designer on projects, her take on how rhythm affects audience perception, and what it means to be a woman in an industry still dominated by men. If you like what you hear, please consider giving us a rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. It really helps us grow and share the stories of these amazing creators. And now, please enjoy this conversation with Judith Gruber Stitzer. Judith, welcome to the Screen Composer Studio. Adrian, hi. Thanks. <laughs> so wonderful to have you. You you look like you're um, coming to us from a, a very beautiful, uh, cozy setting uh, for those of us not watching on, on video. Can you describe where you're at? Um, I'm in the eastern townships of Quebec, about an hour and a quarter from Montreal, in a log house um, perched on a little mountaintop surrounded by a nature reserve of many, 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 many acres filled with critters. It, it, it looks absolutely idyllic. Do you do a lot of writing up there? Do you, is it a sort of creative space? I, I, I normally do. I, I go back and forth into the city, but when the pandemic struck, uh, we escaped here. And I have um, a cloned workstation for composing mm -hmm. here as well as in two locations in the city. And so I was already set up to work out here. And so I love I love working here. Oh yeah. And then I, I really enjoy going back into the city to work with musicians and engineers and stuff. So it's a nice balance. And and you're you're actually you have a an internet satellite connection. Uh, you're not even hardwired up there. You were telling me about how hard it is actually to get anyone to come out there and, and give you a proper like landline. Actually, yeah. Tomorrow we have someone coming, and I'm going to offer to um, bolt to the side of the log house a 50 foot seriously aluminum mm -hmm. tower to try to get a sight line because the trees are very tall around the house and we're on the top of a mountain. But when, uh, what was it? I don't know, about six years ago, I was working on a Nickelodeon cartoon series and we didn't even have satellite internet. It was just mm. awful then. It was with Bell and it was just about dial up. So I'd have to go to the local general store and buy a bottle of water or Coke or whatever. And they'd give me 30 minutes of free internet. And I'd sit in the parking lot and upload a week's worth of music oh for the TV God. series in LA. And they wow. thought that this was really funny. <laughs> and so oh once a week I'd go to the general store and, and it wound up that I would just leave the laptop there behind the counter and it would upload that I'd go back and pick it up. And I, <laughs> you know, I sent the pictures, they thought it was very charming. I thought it after a while it was less than charming. Right. Um, but so the satellite was a great improvement but it's very dependent upon the weather. For example, today it's overcast and it's starting right. to rain a little bit. Mm. And so when it's cloudy, sometimes it just disappears. just disappears. And again, people sometimes find this charming that I can do a Skype call if the weather's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess you have to take the good with the bad, right? Exactly, exactly. So when you're working on this Nickelodeon show, did they, were they aware of your situation and what you were actually trying to wrangle to get it done? Yeah, they were. And I was going into the city too. I did a lot of the work in the city, but it was summer for part of the project and I wanted to be here. And uh, so it, it actually worked out. Uh, it's kind of funny how, um, you know, the Los Angelinos that uh, are working in the industry, they'll come up sometimes to Canada. They have interactions with Canadian composers. And it is that that is sort of consistently like, oh, this is so nice. It's so charming. Like, um, I think it was Donald Kwan that had some people up from Los Angeles and they just loved the fact that you could go from the studio, step outside and there were restaurants. You didn't have to drive anywhere and you could go to a store and you could do this and you could do that. You know, and they just thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. I'm like, welcome to Toronto, everyone. <laughs> well, they, they, I guess they never heard of New York City. Yeah, <laughs> I guess not. Speaking of the States, that's where you began your journey in life, isn't it? You were, you were in uh, New York City and, and partly I was Jersey. born in New York and then my family moved out when I was five. 
Mm -hmm. And we moved to the newly created suburbs. And uh, I had a very happy childhood in the suburbs. I, they, my family was clever enough to buy the last house in development in front of mm. a forest. And, uh, and so I got to see a little bit of nature, something that they never had growing up in the city. And so it was, it was a happy time. So was when you were growing up, was it a, is it a musical family that you were in? A casual musical family, yeah. My father and mother both loved singing. And uh, my brother is quite a bit older than me. And uh, he had a, a doo-wop band. He was mm. the lead singer and sang high and low. And some of my happier memories of my childhood with my brother um, have to do with him practicing with the three other guys downstairs. And my mother would go sing with them a little bit. And once he played in a local the in a movie theater in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, uh, they performed. <laughs> And yeah, it was, it was fun. But I mean, it was just, you know, singing when we're doing the dishes together or something. Right. But um, my mother, because she was, I think, a frustrated performer, she did sign me up with a local um, uh, half-baked off-Broadway, off-off-off-Broadway <laughs> theater troupe uh, in the boondocks of New Jersey. And right. uh, out-of-work actors from New York would come and produce um, musical comedies. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so she would take me, the first one I think I did was South Pacific. And I was like eight years old, nine years old, you know, I was playing the kid in a pillowcase on stage, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. And also because they were kind of rough and tumble. They were smoking and cursing and it was just a whole other world. And so wow. I loved it. And I stayed with them until I was 14. And then I started doing musical comedies in high school. But um, my big moment was when I graduated from being a Lilliputian in The Wizard of Oz to Dorothy. Oh, Because wow. the girl who had been playing Dorothy grew out of the dress. Right. <laughs> that was the primary, <laughs> you know, your competency is one thing, but can you wear the dress? Exactly. Wow, that's such an interesting thing, having those actors come out, because they have such a wealth of experience, and it's just because of their current position that they're going out to these other locales to teach. I mean, you must have had a bit of an education there on, on how narrative, uh, you know, plays or, or any kind of, um, you know, drama is actually put together and, and being part of that must have been quite impactful as well. It's funny, you know, Adrian, I've never thought of it that way as influencing my career choice. I always think of the fact that I have a degree in English education and books and literature mm -hmm. has always been something that's been a focus in my life. Right. Um, but yeah, I'll have to think about that. Surely it did. Yeah. Your brother's singing and you're participating in that and your mother singing as well. And there's sort of being a sort of casual, as you say, musical experience in the family. I'm assuming there's not a lot uh, that is, you know, rigorous or, or based on reading a lot or, 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 um, no, it was all by theory. ear. My mother taught herself how to play a few tunes and that's fascinating. Yeah. My parents, um, when they were recording each other, it was a long, long time ago, but they went into a record recording booth that you could do oh, in New York City. Yeah. Many long, many, 78. And yeah. you'd buy the 78 and each of them sang a love song to the other. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. But I did, I did have piano lessons as a kid for a few years. Right. And uh, my parents bought me a guitar when I was 13 because I heard on the grapevine in school that I could get out of uh, class if I joined the Hootenanny Club. And so, and so <laughs> I asked for a guitar, learned three chords, and um, La Bamba was my ticket out of Spanish class. You know, oh I was able God. to tour around to the other classes, warbling, yeah. That's amazing. So music's, music's been fun for me. It, it, I wish I'd had a, um, a more rigorous musical training. I think mm -hmm. that if I were to redo my life, I would go to a conservatory. And, uh, and really study music, but I really have come into it from the back door completely. I mean, you know, I think that's where it all began. You know, that's music originally was an oral tradition only. And I think I feel I feel there's a certain type of musician that comes out of that where you where you learn to listen first. And, and you're not sort of I always found it very strange that when you start to learn music, quote unquote, uh, the first thing you they really push is reading, which to me is like teaching a baby how to read before it can speak words. No, you just go ma 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 pa ba ba, and then you start to form sentences and interact with people, and then way down the road, then you start to go, okay, here's the words on a page. Here are these weird symbols. So, not having anyone who was a professional musician in the family, where did when did when and how did the idea come to you to do music as a profession? 
And where, did you see some sort of a clear path on how to do that? No, um, I arrived in Montreal never intending to stay. Um, I'm, I'm American, as, as we just mentioned, and I came to visit and simply never left. And uh, it was at a time in my life when that seemed like a, a thing to do. <laughs> um, and uh, I was playing, I was busking in the metro, playing very bad violin. Um, and uh, uh, someone who was producing a video asked if I could play an Eric Satsi um, song on the piano, and I could. And I was nervous that he was going to be recording. It was very casual. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just was improvising in the beginning. And he liked what I did. And he said, you know, I'll pay $50 for that. And I thought that was great. <laughs> so, and then when I saw it with the picture, I thought it was really very interesting. And it kind of just bubbled in the back of my mind. And then I was approached because I was in a band. And so I, I had a little bit of a public persona. Someone asked me to score a very beautiful um, short fiction film, just really very sensitive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I did it and loved it. And that was the beginning of the bug, I think. I realized that putting music to story was something that suited me. Before that, when you were in Montreal, you were playing with the Wonder Brass, and that was an all woman uh, uh, troupe. Was and you you sort of say that you learned to compose by working with them and, and writing music for that ensemble. Was that ever something you thought you'd follow the path down uh, as a just as a as a pure composer apart from picture? No, um, but I have to go back one step before Wonder Brass. Um, I was a musician for a poet singer named Marie Savard, mm. who was a kind of Leonard Cohen type in Montreal, just wonderful poet and a very particular singer. And I arrived in the band, uh, there were two other women, uh, after they'd been playing together for a year and a half. And I think playing with them taught me to listen. Mm. It was the first time I was inside arrangements right. and arrangements that were very um, non-traditional and very fluid. Uh, you know, no metronome that breathed with this person that was singing, was accompanying a singer who was, right. you know, swaying around. And uh, that was a great lesson in listening. And then Wonder Brass, because they knew me through the Marie Savard group, asked if I could play bass for them. And um, I had a Volkswagen van at the time, and I always suspected that they really wanted my van <laughs> so, because I'd never played bass. Right. And so I said, sure, I'll play bass. Um, and I had a hard time even hearing the notes in the beginning because I'd been playing, you know, right. bad violin with Marie Savard and mandolin a bit. Um, but uh, composing with Wonder Brass was fascinating because we were seven uh, musicians and uh, again a very eclectic group um, all self-taught uh, no rules were followed um, and we were inventing things for ourselves to understand structure and arrangement mm. and um, you know doing an arrangement for four brass instruments and a drum and it was it was a great great uh, musical lesson and right. each of us composed and arranged and there was friction and joy with that whole process as well. Yeah. And so it was, wow. it was a great education. It sounds like that was your conservatory in a way, because, you know, you're learning four part writing and it seems like, you know, you have to make it sound correct in some way. And whether it's by ear or other measures, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm going to jump forward a little bit just because there's a thread of something that you, you um, uh, spoke about just now. Uh, and that has to do with metronomes and timing and an idea about, tempo within scenes and you have some really interesting thoughts about how to approach that and and what it does to yeah the viewer. i've changed a little bit well i've become um more organized about it but intuitively in the beginning when i started composing music it seemed to me that if music didn't have um an even or um predictable uh meter uh that the the viewer would unconsciously be sitting a little bit more forward in their seat as they're watching the film because they couldn't anticipate subliminally what was going to happen with the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And we as a com composer can organize that and 
manipulate, if you like, their, their emotional reaction to the film by playing with those silences. You know, right. a, a classic example is a silence, you know, in Hitchcock Psycho or something, you know, b- before a, a big sc- screaming, horrible scene, but talking about something far more subtle, that it's not a regular beat that's going on, a regular rhythm. And it worked well for me. It was a little hard for musicians who I, were, mm. I was hiring to follow because um, in the beginning, I didn't use a metronome. It was, you know, I had a four-track tape recorder that they would listen to as a guide. It, I, I found a group of musicians that understood this wonky system. Right. Um, and then I, I changed and, and I used, I use a, you know, a metronome or a click track and I, I properly notate it now. So I have the same effect. But um, for sure, I think score can become wallpaper and um, can detach us from the, uh, from the scene rather than drawing us into it um, if it's too predictable. Mm. And I guess on the other hand, too, when, you, when, you're, when you're using uh, a, a tempo that's understood and, and fairly clear and, and musical language that resolves in a way that the audience is anticipating and expect, you, you create this sense of, of comfort and, and feeling familiarity, like, this is fine, this is okay, we're all good, everything is nice. And if you're sh- as you're shifting between those two things, it would be a very powerful thing. Um, one thing that I would definitely say about your music is that it has so much breath in it. You, you're always taking these moments to sort of breathe, and it feels like, it doesn't feel like I'm breathing on a metronome. It feels like I would breathe normally. Or And then also you're sort of, you're, you're removing um, when I think I should breathe or when that breath would naturally come, and that sets up that anticipation or that slight tension. I think it was the dumbwaiter robert altman's film that i was watching where i really felt like that opening sequence when they're driving down the road towards that uh, that house is so there's it's such tension filled and part of it is the dissonance that you're creating but also it is that uh you know you're not sure what to make of the meter like it's hard to beat out and it's not that it's nonsense or it doesn't make sense it's got a definite internal structure but it's very fluid and 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 sets a great tension it's it's really interesting um and i've heard other composers talk about the same thing but oddly enough and maybe this goes back to your, you know, whether conservatory was a good idea or not, was a lot of a lot of trained composers are going towards this system now, I find. I'm having a lot of conversations with people who say, I'm actually moving towards free scoring and not using any kind of metronomic, you know, beat and just trying to uh, react to the picture very instinctively. Well, very, there's, there's an inherent beat to films. Oftentimes yes. documentaries are 100 beats per minute. Um, oh, wow. or 80 if it's sad you know yeah. I mean it's it's quite unbelievable sometimes how how editors well so even before I knew that they were using temp music as much there's there's always an inherent beat to yeah. something yeah do you do you find uh, you have uh, editors that are more uh, that you enjoy working with more because they're more musical and they have a sense of rhythm um, no I can't say that um, I think the editors I enjoy working with the most are the ones who don't use as much temp music Um, (laughs) I think those are my favorite, Uh, but I wanted to say something. One of the nicer compliments I've received was from an engineer two years ago, I guess I had scored us a half hour special for Nelvana. Mm -hmm. Um, and it starred Whoopi Goldberg as a voice. And it was just a lovely project, uh, based on a children's book. And, um, the score was delivered and I arrived at the mix a few days later the final mix and uh, and the engineer said that the music mixed itself in that I had so many, I'm saying this because of the pauses you were talking about. Mm. There were so many pauses and lapses and then it would start up again. Um, and th- that pleased me because, but it, of course it's musical too. You know, it, it right. has to make sense musically. Yeah. That's very so, yeah, interesting. I'm, st- I'm still doing it. That's great. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of what, where your career got launched, uh, you know, working on that first film where you beat out Eric Satie and, um, you know, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the pitching process in that early, in the early stages. Yeah, there's a Laurie Anderson um, concert that happened and I was standing outside the venue in Montreal waiting to go in and someone introduced me to Bonnie Klein, Mm. who uh, uh, was an extraordinary um, uh, documentary filmmaker. She won an Oscar. Um, for one of her films. Anyway, she, I was introduced to her and she knew the band I was playing with, Wonder Brass. And she asked if I'd like to go to the film board to let them hear some of my music, that they were mm-hmm. looking for new composers. And so I went with a cassette 
went in the front door, got lost in the bowels of the film board in the basement for about <laughs> 10 minutes, and then arrived in this room where there were eight directors sitting around and a little cassette player in the middle. I mean, quite astonishing. Oh, wow. And I popped in my demo, and so eight directors heard it at the same time. And one raised her hand and said, I have a project, three half-hour films. You want to do it? And... Uh, it just started things. I bought a house with that contract. <laughs> wow. That must have been a little nerve wracking, though, being suddenly thrust into a room with eight directors who are like, all right, this better be good. They weren't like that. Um, they were very supportive. And I'm an outgoing person. I'm comfortable on stage. You know, I was used to doing shows. It's it was it was fun for me. This was just like, huh, what is this kind of thing? <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't overthink it before I went, nor while I was there. I know for myself, mostly as a fan, I've never actually worked on any NFB projects, but I know as a fan, they definitely have a certain quality. There's a feeling that always comes up when you see that logo emerge. And then as the film sort of emerges, um, it, it is its own thing very much. Uh, what was it like working there? I've worked there so much my entire career. I mean, I was nurtured there. I was... Yeah, I mean, they taught me to be the composer that I am because they hired me so much. Um, uh, it's been wonderful. Um, mm. They allowed me to explore something like sound design. Um, one little anecdote about that. Um, they had a sound design internship and I was going to take it. And one of the executive producers in documentary took me aside and said, you don't do that. Because if you do do that, they won't, they won't hire you as a film composer anymore. Oh, wow. um, and so I didn't do it. I half regret it. Um, but I'm sure his advice was, was, was correct. But I started, I was invited to do sound design for short animated films. Right. Because they're so short. And it's such a suspension of disbelief that it's good to have, I think, sometimes one imagination. Mm. Um, that creates the entire sound world, the sound universe. Um, and that's continued. I love doing sound design for short animated films. And that probably wouldn't have happened in the private sector. My experience, certainly in the private commercial animation sector, was that the two branches, at least in my experience, were kept very, very separate. I asked if I could send my music demos to the sound department so they could hear what I was doing and ask for a Pro Tools session of their sound effects so that I could play around it and integrate it into my own concept in terms of timing and all. And they, they didn't want us to communicate um, because they weren't used to that kind of um, intertwining between, wow. between the two branches. And so that's why it was clever of the film board. Actually, I'm the only one along with uh, Norman Roger who's, who, of composers who actually um, do their own sound design. But it's a treat and it's, I find so much easier than music. <laughs> is, it a, is it a separate process for you? You find that you're putting a box around each thing and working on it separately, or is it something that emerges at the same time? Do you think, oh, here's a good moment for sound design? The two of them work beautifully together because I do the sound design first. Mm. Um, and so while I'm doing the ambiences and the Foley session and all the specifics, I'm always thinking about the music and the timing of the scenes and, and the inner dialogue. What's not said on screen or with the sound effects? What, is, what will the music bring to this? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I'm constantly editing the sound design as well because I know I'm going to take care of this with the music. And I find by the time I, like two weeks after for a short film, once I've done the rough work for the sound design, I'm raring to go for the music because uh, I'm in it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the world of, of this animated film. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. And you're not, you don't have that, that worry. Again, it's very interesting that they would separate those two divisions and say, do not talk to one another because that's almost like the lighting department, not talking to the camera department. It's almost like, well, those. I have to say are... it's still, even at the film board. Um, I mean, I've been doing this for so long. I remember, you know, dubbing reels and there'd be an interlock when it would be the first time the director would get to hear the music and the sound effects at the same time and you have room with all the spinning reels of film and <laughs> it was always an awkward process because there would be train wrecks between the sound and the music sometimes because we had no idea what we were doing the other person you know the two departments and so it's still at least in my experience not common for the sound team to offer 
to send me what they're doing. Um, uh, I oftentimes am the one that initiates that um, mm -hmm. because I just find it really helpful and fun, you know. So I know what they're doing and they know what I'm doing and we make a better soundtrack. Yeah. It seems like such a natural marriage. And then oftentimes it's, it's sort of, there's this friction of trying to get it to come together. It's very odd. I should say I do this for live action too. Uh -huh. I offer to do it. I, I right. won't take on the sound design for live action, particularly a long film because it's just a huge job and there's sure. dialogue editing. Yeah. But I like to sometimes negotiate a little creative niche for myself because what I do sometimes um, is sound design. Um, you know, because as you know, uh, with samplers and, and what we can create ourselves, um, we can, we can play a melody with a hammer, you know, pitching it to, to different tones. And so, uh, depending on the project, sometimes I ask to, to be given a little freedom in that, in that way. That's interesting. And that segs us perfectly to Bully Dance, which is an all percussion store. And uh, even the sound design itself is done with percussion. So it's, it's a really fun, peculiar, uh, completely enthralling uh, animation with no dialogue and just these curious characters who, who live in this very curious world. It's about bullying in, uh, within the school environment. And uh, so it's a story of a bully who is bullying a puny little character. And the director, uh, this was... Um, at least graphically inspired by her dance classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was someone who had broken a leg uh, who had come to the dance class. And so there was, you know, accommodation for this person with a broken leg. Anyway, she said to me that she wanted it to be only percussion because it's common in the dance classes that she was taking that there'd be a live percussionist. Oh. And I thought, great, all percussion. Then when I started thinking about it, I thought, oh my God, after 10 minutes of percussion, you know, we'd be numb. <laughs> um, how will I ever draw anyone into the into the emotional journey of the film right. if it's yeah. if it's all drums? Um, then I started thinking about the different pitches of drums and what to do, and I decided to to do it all with samplers. And I worked with a percussionist friend of mine in the beginning, um, and then uh, just kind of to get me going, I did a tempo map with the director because she wanted to animate to the music. Um, or to the to the beats um, because you see it so sync. So sync, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I looked at the animatic with her, which is a filmed storyboard, and decided the tempo ahead of time, which is something I never do mm. um, for each scene. And because it is like a little thriller in a way, <laughs> a little animated right. thriller. Yeah. So as it's getting more tense, it's going faster, and then it slows down. So the tempo was one thing, and I told her I'd give her a simple you know, click track with a few beats to inspire her animation. And I wound up doing 95% of the soundtrack, mm. um, which she had to animate to and leaving off just the end part, which I would call the Foley. Mm -hmm. So once I had the animation, then I went back and added shakers for the bully or little tiny vocal effects or for a ball that's bouncing around, just stuff like that, just very small specifics. Um, but the limitation of percussion in my mind was the tonality, the pitch of sure. what was available to me. And also because scoring for animation is so precise, at least how I approach it. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to do it to the frame, you know, and to work with a percussionist, I'm not going to write all that out and, and to have them improvise. It just was an ungainly process in my mind. So using, doing it by myself with samplers made sense. Mm -hmm. And also because I could cheat with the pitch, as you know, right. you can take a drum and pitch it much higher, much lower. And so I was able to create a kind of melodic subscore to it mm. using um, unnaturally pitched percussion and then uh, using some some metal percussion that that gave uh, uh, more of a melodic element at, at uh, a critical time in the film mm -hmm. and it was super fun to do this podcast is brought to you by the screen composers guild of canada celebrating its 40th year in 2020 the SCGC is a national association of professional music composers and producers for film, television, and media, whose mission includes promoting the music, status, and rights for film, television, and media composers in Canada. Special thanks to the SOCAN Foundation for financial support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers. And now, back to our show. Do you feel that the emotion or and the dramatic sort of 
emotional currency in narrative is is mostly spoken to via the harmony and the melody and how those two interact? No, I think it's what the music is expressing. I think mm. um, I always try to create with my music what is intended in the scene. Mm -hmm. And it's a big assumption on my part to know what the director is intending. Um, but nonetheless, we all as composers have to take that leap. And so um, the music is successful, I think, if it hits the right emotional tone or chord with the spectator. Um, am I answering your question? <laughs> it may it may in all honesty be a stupid question what i'm what i wanted to drive at too is an idea that you know you said the director posed this idea of having an all percussion score and your first thought was well how am i going to address the, the emotional narrative was did you push back on that idea originally or was it simply something you went okay this is the new challenge and here i go no, that's it. It was the new challenge. And um, I, I was kind of like, oh, goody, uh, right. how am I going to do this? Oh, that's um, great. The first animation director I ever worked with is a phenomenal artist, Caroline Leaf, um, considered one of the great animators of all time. And she told me a story I've never forgotten. Um, she's credited with inventing this morphing between scenes. She um, scratched on IMAX film but she didn't know how to edit. And so because mm -hmm. she didn't know how to edit, she decided she should just morph between scenes, do these beautiful, graceful, swishing movements with her animation. And so all this to say that limitations either self-imposed because of whatever thing we have going in our head or lack of technique, or I've never done that before, or imposed upon us by a director or producer is great, I think. That's why mm -hmm. film music for me is is great because it's it's a structure it's mm -hmm. it's it's all kinds of limitations that i can't do this kind of music or that kind of music or this tempo or that instrument um yes. i think limitations are great and so all this to say for the percussion only percussion it it suited me it pleased me and i just had to solve the problem of how to not make everyone fall asleep because <laughs> It's like banging for, for nine minutes or 10 minutes. Right. Well, it's a very energetic piece and a very energetic score as well. So I don't think there was ever any danger of that happening. About two years after the film came out, I received a phone call from a synchronized swimming coach in Toronto who wanted to use the bully dance score for a synchronized swimming routine. Mm -hmm. And I was speechless when he said this to me because you know what the acoustics are in a pool. You know, and I couldn't think of a worse thing to use in a pool oh, yeah, environment right. than a bunch of drums, you know. Oh, yeah. And I said, and he wanted to know if he could have the rights to use it and what would I charge him. And I said, the only, the only thing I want is a video of this happening. Um, of course, you can use the music, um, but please film it and send it to me. And okay. never heard back from him. I never got a video. But Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But yeah, a I funny idea. <laughs> Who would think to use that? That's that's I, I you know it didn't occur to me until you said. And of course, yeah, the the echoey you know it's just like you may as well be in an oil drum. It's just terrible for acoustics in there. Yeah, and and were the swimmers going to be fighting in the water? You know, right. <laughs> I mean. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> Well, now after after this conversation, I'm going to go and look up how do they do synchronized swimming. I have so many questions <laughs> now. No, really, yeah. You got to work with Martha Wainwright on When the Day Breaks, what, and that was a Palme d'Or winner and Oscar-nominated sh uh, short animated film. What was it like working on that? Well, that was a treat. Um, uh, Martha came into it because I had gone to the Spectrum to see her show, and she sang an Edith Piaf song. Mm. with this wonderful little wobble to her voice that Edith right. Piaf had. Yeah. And at the time I was trying to find two singers who could do a 1930s style um, vocal. I needed a female and a male, and they were very idiosyncratic ways of singing in the 30s. Um, right. And it was hard to find someone to do it. And as soon as I heard her do it, and I know with the Edith Piaf song, I thought she'd be perfect. Um, and, uh, and she was. Yeah. So she was, she was fun. It was, it was fine. I knew the McGarrigals casually socially as well. Right. Um, so that must've been a treat. Cause I know the McGarrigals were definitely a big influence on you growing up as well in terms of your musical education. So that must've been quite a treat to have everyone. Not you know. for my musical education. It was for my um, geographic wandering oh. um, because I was, I was living in Alabama before coming to Montreal. 
And I was looking for a place and a way to be. I, um, I was in a transitional period in my life. And uh, someone from Montreal visited, someone I didn't know, visited the person, my, my roommate, and left uh, Dancer with Bruised Knees, the cassette. And uh, I had a boom box and uh, started listening to it, like, obsessively. And I'd never heard those harmonies before. So, you know, when you go visit a place, it's read about a great restaurant in the old quarter of the city, and you're going to go right. see it. It's, I didn't move to Montreal because of Dancer with Bruce and these, but it, it, it was part of the aura in my head when I decided to go visit Montreal and never left that there was this something I'd never heard before. When you got to Montreal, did it, did it fulfill that expectation or was it something different? And how, does, how do you feel about it now? It absolutely fulfilled the expectation because I landed on the plateau. Uh, the McGarrigals were practicing there, but they were like out of my radar. Mm -hmm. But I was hired um, to play with Marie Savard because I was in a little cafe and there was an upright piano and someone started playing the piano and I happened to have my mandolin because I'd been busking on the street and I started playing with them and I got hired to play in this band and my life changed because of that. And so, yeah, it, it was exactly... Wow. what I had not imagined, but I um, uh, had hoped perhaps, you know, yeah. I didn't know what I was looking for. It just, it just happened. And it's still sort of your spiritual home at this point. It's a wonderful place to be. It's mm. um, I liked Montreal because it had the schmutz factor. I don't know if you know the word schmutz. Oh, yeah, of course, means, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, coming Pretty. from New York, yeah, coming from New York, I liked um, I liked the schmutz factor in Montreal that I don't see in Ottawa or Toronto or right. Vancouver, yep. Calgary. Um, and so it felt comfortable to me. You know, I grew up in Germany, so I'm always I'm always uh, drawn to any place that has any kind of a European feel to it. Because I've, and it, the one thing that strikes me about Montreal that echoes what I see happening in Europe is that even, I mean, this is starting to change, unfortunately, but... Uh, you know, people have an attitude where we work to live. We don't live to work. And I think that's that's a that's a wonderful thing to see. Uh, I wanted to talk about a documentary that you scored called By Woman's Hand. Some beautiful, like wonderful uh, string quartet writing in that. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the film, what it was like working on it, and also a little bit about pigeon getting pigeonholed into being a specific type of composer. I guess I had done the Altman films before by woman's hand mm -hmm. um no i'm just trying to think because the altman film uh the the room was the first time i'd ever even hired string players right. um and so by woman's hand was the first time i had a string quartet um and a mezzo soprano and so it was really thrilling for me uh to try this you know try composing a different style of music um and and it was such a beautiful film um, and so it was really quite enjoyable to, to compose for it. And then the joke was afterwards, like a few weeks after it came out, the film board is like a big shopping center, you know, big hallways and filled each, each booth, so to speak, each office has a different director. And I ran into a director in the hallway and she vaguely knew me and she said, you know, Judith, I was thinking of asking you to score my new film, but you know, you're a classical composer. <laughs> and this just cracked me up. You know, I was right. what, three years out of Wonder Brass or something. I'd never worked with string players before. So it's, you're always the last thing you do. I, I find this with animation as well, because a lot of my more well-known projects have been animated films mm -hmm. that sometimes a live action director will, will think to themselves or even say to me, but you know, you're an animation composer. Um, and, and so we, we have to um, have a good relationship with the director and producer uh, for them to, trust us with their film um, right. and for them to understand our talent, I think. Uh, sticking with By a Woman's Hand for a moment, you know, the film itself is about an environment of women supporting one another in this sort of interesting little, um, you know, almost like a group of seven, but only women. I wondered if you would talk a little bit about your own position as a woman in the industry and what that's been like. We've done a, the Screen Composers Guild has done a gender-based study and, you know, it's shocking, but not not in the sense that we didn't have that idea that that was what it was going to be. But at least a couple of years ago when that um, study was released, it showed that there was only about 2% of the total makeup of screen composers in Canada were women. 
Um, what are your thoughts and feelings about that? Too bad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, absolutely. it's just really too bad. Um, I started at the National Film Board um, because they had an affirmative action um, initiative. Uh, studio D was a studio that was formed uh, because they realized that film board, just like you said, for film composers, the film board internally did their own survey and realized there were very few female directors. So they started a studio uh, to encourage women directors. Um, it's, it's a two edged sword um, because the studio is formed. They, they create documentaries for subjects that hadn't been addressed by male directors. Um, they become women's films. Um, it, it's, it's very hard to legislate social change. Right. And that's what affirmative action is. And so to be the only female film composer at the film board for many, many years um, was not something I thought about until there were times when I thought, hmm, I wonder why I didn't get that contract. And, and you can't think about it too much because, and you certainly can't talk about it to anyone because you sound whiny mm. and, and you can't prove anything. I mean, why should anyone hire me or anyone else? It's a very subjective decision. Right. Um, it's very hard to, to be sure about gender prejudice. I think the kindest thing I can say is that um, Oftentimes we feel most comfortable with people like ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a male director, you unconsciously will go for a male composer. Maybe um, it's not a rule, but you know, I think I've been hired by a lot of female directors, I suspect because of that. Right. Um, and so how do you deal with that? You know, you just have to make it so that there's so many women and so many men male composers that we just get all jumbled up together. I never thought of myself as a female composer. Right. When I played in Wonder Brass, we were nine women at one point. And inevitably for the interviews that we would do with the press, uh, it would start out with, why are you only women? Right. And that would just make me nuts. You know, mm. why are we only women? I don't know. You know, like, why are the Beatles only men? Um, mm. Why are you asking me this question? You're asking the question because it's so unusual. Right. And so we have to get to the point where it's no longer unusual. And I think in the last three years, I've noticed um, more women coming into the profession. Yes. Um, and so that's great. Do you have a sense of why there was a lack of women com uh, screen composers? I suspect it was parallel to the lack of female directors. Um, um, and this speaks to my theory. This is just my theory. I've never read right. this anywhere, but... Yeah gender prejudice in terms of being prejudiced towards your own gender mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a funny camaraderie kind of way. Yes. Um, you know, nothing creepy or negative about it. I think it's just a natural thing, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I haven't even actually really thought this through, but the more female directors we have, maybe the more women, uh, compose, female composers are being hired, but it's still, makes me uncomfortable because I never want to be hired because I'm a woman. I don't think of myself as a female composer. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm doing female music, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, really? Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I, I guess, I guess if I compare it to another industry, which would be uh, professional cooking, the brigade system in professional cooking is extraordinarily masculine. It's extremely aggressive. It's all about testosterone and anger and, a poorly controlled, uh, you know, rage issues and a system of a, a very authoritarian system that really just bullies people until they comply. And, you know, there's a certain mentality that I think is okay suffering through that. What I was always surprised by is I don't think there's really a parallel, I mean, other than working on, you know, some higher level, um, uh, you know, productions where there is that, kind of, you know, the, the kind of directors that sometimes get uh, front page news. But, you know, I, I don't think there was anything inherently, um, you know, one way or the other. Like there, there was nothing holding anybody back from becoming a composer that was like that, like a brigade system where you just go, yeah, I don't want to have any part I, of that. I, I, disagree, I, I disagree, Adrian. Okay, um, I think her name is Sarah Caldwell. It's unimportant, but um, think of how many female um, orchestra leaders there are. Mm -hmm. um, 
how many how many women were in orchestras until the last 20 years right um and so film composers come from that world it was uh, a completely male dominated world right. the directors the producers um yeah so i think it's just it's because things are very 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 slowly changing that's really extraordinarily slowly changing actually you just completely uh that's that's obviously the key right because it's not it's not you didn't very few people seem to start off with the idea i'm just out of nowhere going to become a screen composer there are either composers first or they're in bands and boy is there ever prejudice against women in in the band world and and, and uh, pop music and rock music is just extraordinarily terrible so that that makes a lot of sense that's very interesting well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that uh, everyone listening will also be, you know, that will, it's, it's, an, it's an eye opener and we're having these conversations more and more often. And I think that's really healthy. And um, as you say, you know, as much as it is an unconscious bias in many cases, you know, most men probably don't even think about this and they don't even consider what uh, the challenges are and how that might feel for somebody else or why this is actually a problem. Uh, you know, commonly the, the statement is, well, I don't see a problem. Like no one's actually actively telling women not to be composers, but yeah, that's not, that's not exactly. I was speaking to someone exactly who point. came through the film composer graduate school system in Montreal. And mm -hmm. he was saying that there were more women than men uh, in his class. Wow. Um, and yet, and yet those that went on to a professional career, uh, women were in the minority. Right. I guess also when you don't see models uh, of what it's what is possible, you've got your Rachel Portmans and your Ann Dudleys, but you know they're really and your Leslie Barbers, but there are very few as compared to the men. Again, you've got that very small percentage, so it probably makes you feel like it's oh, it's, it's just it's it's a very insidious, subtle mm -hmm. um, kind of prejudice that that it's not it's not fun to even think about let alone thinking consciously about entering into it. I never gave it much thought, you know, um, right. I was hired. I was hired a lot by the film board. I was like merrily skipping through the hallways and doing my <laughs> soundtracks for different films. And it was just only after a certain number of years when I was getting, and it just the ebb and flow of being a freelancer, but sure. I, I wondered, hmm. And then also in the technical department of post, um, uh, uh, post production for sound, it's also a very, very male um, dominated field. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time that I was brought into the film board, there was a female mixer who was brought in. And, and uh, um, both of us had worked for Altman. And so Robert Altman and so both of us had a letter of recommendation from him. Oh, wow. um, but again, nobody followed her. Uh, the film board has just hired a female mixer uh, yeah, just now, like, you know, many, 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 many years later. Wow. So it, these changes are happening slowly, um, but they're happening. And it's, right. for someone like me, it's best not to think about it and just to go along my merry way. Well, you mentioned Robert Altman, and I wanted to, to wind the clock back a little bit because, boy, it must have been absolutely amazing to work with such a legend. Uh, and, and with the dumbwaiter... You also got to work with a um, uh, a screenplay by Harold Pinter, who's double Oscar nominee. Worked on films like Trail and The Trail and Sleuth. I mean, this is this is just powerhouse, um, you know, people at the top of their craft. What was it like working with him? He was a dream. I mean, uh, he was by far the most famous person I've ever worked with, and probably one of the more generous ones I've ever worked with. Um, I think I got the job in part because of being an English major from college, oh. because I knew who Pinter was. Right. And so when I got this call to make a demo for Altman, I was actually in Quebec City playing in a band for a big show. And uh, I took the bus back to Montreal at 11 at night, put together a demo specifically for what I would imagine a Pinter score would sound like, whatever uh. that was in my mind. Right. And then took the bus back to Quebec City the following morning and sent the demo to, to Altman. And Altman didn't know any of the big uh, François Dompierre, Louis Seguin, or any of the big uh, composers or musicians in Montreal. And it was just a pile of cassettes for him to listen to. And he liked mine, um, mm. I think because it was Pinterest, because it was kind of bling, <laughs> because Harold Pinter's plays are, I mean, how many people have a, have their name, their, their family name as a word in the dictionary, you know? Right. 
to, to really mean inexplicable. Right. And so knowing Pinter, I think, helped me. Um, and then he, he was just a great person. I mean, he hired Shelley Duval. She was a waitress. Uh, he liked picking people up. Yeah. Um, she was a waitress in Texas, I think. He was having a hamburger and he came across her and said, hey. So he was a bit like that with me. You know, I arrived on a mobilette with a salad bowl on my head instead of a, instead of a helmet. And he loved it, you know. And, <laughs> and, and he asked me if I wanted to go to L.A. with him. Um, wow. after I finished two films. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one of the big moments in my life that I regret how I responded. Um, I said no. Um, uh, he wanted to know if I wanted to be a music supervisor. And I thought, no, I want to compose music. Um, and I should have just said, yeah, sure, let's see what happens, you know. Right. But he was, he, he, he left me alone, uh, which is extraordinary to think about it. The, the first one I did, Dumbwaiter, um, he asked me what equipment I had. And I've right. never been asked that before. Yeah, for that's an odd question, right? Yeah, I had a four track cassette player and my mandolin and a guitar and a bass and a piano and musicians I could hire. And I said, um, well, I have a sequencer because I've been reading about sequencers. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Um, and I named, you know, two different companies and he said, oh, okay. I don't know if he knew anything about it. So the next day I went to a music store and took out a $10,000 loan and bought wow. equipment <laughs> and, uh, and did his film the first time I ever used a sequencer. It was just like an onboard. Before that I was using the time code, you know, when I'd start yeah. on, on the number and all. And then he came to my apartment which is this rickety little apartment on the plateau. And he was just, and my TV monitor was a, I live with someone who's doing like performance art with, with TVs that she would find in the garbage and she would paint them neon colors and, and glue dinosaurs to them. So the monitor for the Altman film had dinosaurs glued all over. He loved it. You know, oh, he just, he, I, I just happened upon the right kind of person. And then he went back to New York and asked if I wanted to score the room. And uh, he never heard a demo. He never heard any of the work in progress. He called me up towards the end of it and asked how it was going. And I said, oh, I think it's really beautiful. And he said, good. It's all I need to hear. Wow. Um, and for, for the dumbwaiter, towards the, at the end of it, when he knew I'd be recording the tracks, um, he sent a bottle of wine to the studio with a little note. Um, uh, because I told him I had wind that I could play on my keyboard in different pitches. And he said, please, after you've finished recording the score, please play the wind throughout the entire film. It was an hour long. And here's a bottle of wine to help you. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. So really, quite literally, I had a glass of wine. And for an hour, I played the wind. And it was responsive to velocity. And I would change the tone every once in a while, according to the scene. And then when we were mixing the film, he would take my wind and bring it up and bring it down. And he grew up in Kansas and wind was a big deal for him. He told me later on, right. isn't that lovely? That's yeah. amazing. And so, wow. Yeah. It was just, yeah, a lovely little thing. Now I got into trouble with his second film because he asked me to fool around. Oh no, that one. Yeah. Right. Um, fool around with sound design because he liked just playing and we got along. Um, and again, that speaks about the division between the sound and the music, but he was a darling. I've never, I've almost never been given that kind of freedom or certainly not by someone of, of, uh, of his experience. All right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like these, these are, this is him, those, those um, projects you're working on were him bringing plays to the screen. Yeah. yeah he had a whole are... period. Come and, back to the five and dime, Jimmy Dean. Yeah. And, and when I'm watching the room and when I'm watching, um, uh, the dumbwaiter, there is a, there is a very play like quality to it. And, and to me, I'm always, when I see something like that, or when I read a script, there's a moment when I go, I don't know, I can't, I don't know where to put music here. It's so dense with, uh, you know, the literature that's contained within the pages. Or the, the stillness of a play, even, right. you know, there is a, yeah. there is a stillness and a beauty of the language that it just floats into the air and stays there. And then you go on to the next sentence. Yeah. And you almost don't want to touch it. How did you approach that? I didn't think about it. Mm, <laughs> instinctual. Just, yeah, because it was a film and they wanted music and it had a dramatic curve to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought music was a good choice for it. Um, the second one, The Room, I really enjoyed doing. Uh, that, was, that was super fun.
what was uh, that use of that's like ten thousand dollars worth of new technology that must have really uh, had quite an effect on how you approached everything from that moment on. Is, is, well, having is, a sequencer rather, you know, that it would automate, you know, that I that it would sync up automatically to the to the VHS machine, which in itself was so awkward, rewinding mm-hmm. and stopping and all that mechanical stuff happening. But yeah, it was it was really nice. It made it more precise. I mean, I was precise before, but now yeah. it was more automated, so to speak. Yeah. And the, have you you you? I feel like you sort of have evolved with the technology as a as a composer as well. Yeah, I'm not using the Insonic sequencer anymore. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke for film composers. But yeah, yeah, I, I I I take to it. I like it. I enjoy it. Um, you know, I'm not the most technical savvy person. I'm not Neil Parfit. Hi, Neil. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I enjoy it. It makes my job so much easier. I feel mm. I've gotten so much better because of using a computer um, for recording. I can I record in my studio now in a way that I never did before. The whole composing, producing of music has become more organic for me mm. as I'm able to do more and more of it myself. Um, oh, that's so interesting. Oh, it's wonderful. One thing I've noticed, um, I remember when I was beginning and I would ask it in a final mix, I'd ask an engineer, or the mixer to do something. And he turned to me and say, no, it's really not possible. Um, but now that everyone uses Pro Tools, well, maybe it wasn't possible for that question. But now that we're all using Pro Tools, I know exactly what's going on. And I find I get frustrated sometimes because I'm so used to doing it myself. So I'm yeah. working with an engineer and I just want to like reach over and, and move <laughs> the mouse myself because it's faster than trying to explain it, you know. Yeah. So, course. yeah, I, I, I love being able to do as much as I can by myself now. That's and then. Great. I equally enjoy handing it off to someone else. Um, that's really nice too. Uh, when we were talking earlier, I asked you about um, challenges and, and you said to me, ask me about getting going. Sometimes if I'm looking at a film and I'm just, I, I can't find the in point, you know, I'm someone who I always begin scoring in the beginning of the film for better mm. or for worse. I have a lot of friends, film composers who develop themes for characters and they fit it all together and they could just start before they have the film and they start with the script. I'm, most often I start with the beginning of the film and just work my plod my way through it and, mm-hmm. and the themes develop and they interlock and they evolve and it just works for me. Right. So if I can't get going and the clock is ticking and I have to get going in terms of my deadline, you know, I think everyone, I'm sure you've done this too. I'll just start like an A, a sustain. I just need something to play against. It's from like playing in a band. So I'll, have a long A that'll go on for two minutes, you know, and oh, mm-hmm. I, I can do a melody on top of that, or I can, or I'll do a little ostinato with the piano, a little tapping or something. So my yeah. early scores, quite a bit of ostinatos in the back, right. in the background, because it was just how I was getting going, you know, and so those were little tricks that I use. I don't, I don't need them anymore. I think now, um, sometimes I look for an interesting sound, an interesting patch. Ah. Um, there are such gorgeous libraries now. Um, or I have, when I'm, when I'm thinking about a project, it's like I have a, a, a whisper in my head, you know, I have a, a half formed thought of a, a sound or an instrument. Um, and I look in my sample library for something that approximates that just to get going. Um, I rarely use the tapping, uh, on the piano or the, the long A anymore, but it's there. I need it. <laughs> what I find clears the way for me most often is that there's already something there, which is the story, the narrative, the film, the picture, something is there. I don't, I don't really think about it as, I don't think about it as a blank page. Uh, if I ever try to approach my own projects or th- something that's away from that, then that becomes something that's a more of a challenge. And I find just spoiling the page with something right away is, is, is a way to go. This isn't important. It's not, you're not, wrecking something there's nothing you're breaking or or just get it going yeah so i definitely understand that so what's what's keeping you busy now what are you working on what's uh what's the next thing for judith i i actually i had i had been about to finish a score that um uh features a song um sung in nonsense russian oh wow um that will be sung by the extended mcgarrigal clan um 
and then the pandemic struck and recording vocals was just impossible and i skipped town and came out to the country so i put that aside and went to a different project that i just finished um and uh so i'll be getting back to that and i realized i should get back to it very very quickly before the second wave hits. Yeah, no, kidding, right? uh, no seriously and yeah. so i'm putting together a strategy of doing location recording perhaps with the various singers one of them is in brooklyn and uh, that's a whole different challenge. And because the director, the, the lyrics were translated into Russian, and now he's just told me he wants it. He, there are certain sounds in Russian that he likes. He doesn't, he doesn't want it to make any sense. So I have to ah. describe what I'm looking for with my Russian translator. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's going to be, that's, that'll, I'll be doing that in the next week or so to try to get, um, because the melody's there, all the harmonies, the score is written, yeah. um, that it sings well. And then the great fun challenge will be to get the singers to sing it. None of them speak Russian. Right. And so, <laughs> so it's going to be, it'll be fun, I think. And then I'm, I've hired a cymbalum player, the king of cymbalum in Montreal. Yeah, I've never, I've never worked with someone it's playing it, so I'm really looking. Just absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's I have great. that to record, um, and uh, and I also have another uh, score. I'll do some kind of light impressionistic jazz. I don't know. I have like mm. a Homeland vibe in my head. You know, you know the Homeland series. Yeah, sure. Um, it was yeah, just beautiful electronic textures with a trumpet. I mean, I start out like this, and as soon as I sit down to actually do it, who knows what direction right. it'll take me in? But uh, yeah. so I I have that. That's so interesting. The, um, the, the, the nonsense Russian almost makes me think about Howard Shore working with Elvish. Any parting words for the audience or a message that you'd like to get out? I feel very, very lucky to have uh, stumbled into this wonderful world of film composing. Um, there's just about nothing I like to do more than sitting in front of a film about to start scoring it and uh, thinking, oh, goody, you know, yeah. let's go. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to do. And so I'm just very grateful. Well, by all accounts, it's it's going absolutely wonderfully for you. Uh, Judith, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing so candidly your stories and insights and perspective on the wonderful work you're doing. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing what's next for you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider showing your support by giving the show a five-star rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. The Screen Composer Studio is produced by myself, Adrian Ellis. Graphics and post-production assistance by Nick Grimshaw. Special thanks to our managing director, Tanya Dedrick, as well as Charlie Finley, Elizabeth Hannon, and Guggen Singh for their support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers or reach out at tscs at screencomposers.ca.